There have been some pretty spectacular space missions since we've had the ability to get off of planet Earth, but few have attempted the complexity and precision required to catch up with a comet travelling at up to 135,000 km an hour, enter an orbit around it and then land a probe onto its surface at less than walking speed. So what does it take to land on a comet? Although the Rosetta mission to Comet 67P churimov gerasimenko was one of the most ambitious at the time, it certainly wasn't the first. The first cometary mission dates back to 1978 with the ICE or the International Cometary Explorer spacecraft, which flew through the tail and within 7,800 kilometers of the Jacobini Zinner comet in 1985 and through the tail of Halley's comet in 1986. Since then, nine missions have passed close by several comets culminating in the Deep Impact mission of July 2005 when NASA sent a two-part probe to Comet Temple 1. The main spacecraft performed the observations whilst a smaller impactor was crashed into the core of the comet to eject material from under the surface, which was then analysed by the main craft. The Rosetta mission would be the first time that a spacecraft had attempted a soft landing on the nucleus of a comet. This wasn't a controlled landing like the Martian landers with rockets to slow its approach. It was more of a slow fall by the Philae lander from the Rosetta orbiter towards the comet from around 20 kilometers away and over a period of seven hours. But how did we get here in the first place? and why Comet 67P churimov gerasimenko The Rosetta mission was a follow-up to the 1986 mission by the ESA spacecraft Giotto to Halley's Comet, which got within 600 kilometers of its core. From that mission, it became obvious that there was much more to study, and that would need much more ambitious future missions. Comets are amongst the oldest objects in the solar system, leftovers, from the material that formed the planets, and they are thought to have brought water and organic compounds to the early Earth, and possibly could have been instrumental in the formation of life. Finding out what comets are made of is like going back billions of years to before the Earth was formed, and that has been of great interest to the scientific community. In the late 1980s and early 90s, ESA and NASA cooperated to build two spacecraft based on the Mariner Mark II designs, which were themselves updated versions of the Voyager and Galileo space probes. The NASA project would be called the Comet Rendezvous Asteroid Flyby, or CRAF, and would visit an asteroid before making an encounter and flying alongside a comet for three years. The ESA project will be called the Comet Nucleus Sample Return Mission, or CNSR, which would land on a comet and return a sample of it back to Earth. But by 1992, NASA had to cancel the CRF project due to budget cuts, so ESA was left to carry on with the CNSR, but by 1993, it too became obvious that the technical difficulties of a sample return mission were just too great for the budget available. The project was redesigned and left out the sample return part and opted for an in-situ examination by a lander on the comet's surface. Originally, Rosetta was due to launch in 2003 and rendezvous with a short period Comet 46P Wurtonen in 2011. But due to a failure of the Ariane 5 rocket in December 2002 and the delay in establishing the cause of a failure, Comet 46P was now poorly positioned and a new comet had to be found that would be suitable to rendezvous with as it came into the inner solar system. Comet 67P would be that new target. It too was a short period comet with an orbit of 6.45 years and would be making its closest approach to the Sun in the summer of 2015. It was larger than Comet 46P at approximately 4.3 by 4.1 kilometers and was traveling at 135,000 kilometers per hour. This speed meant that there was no rocket available that could catch it directly without a huge and impractical amount of fuel. 
So in order to match its speed and orbit, Rosetta would have to use the gravity assist method of slingshotting around Mars and the Earth to get there. From the launch in 2004, Rosetta would slingshot around the Earth, then Mars, then back around the Earth for a second time, and then back around the Earth for a third time. In the process, Rosetta would fly close to asteroid 2867 Steins and asteroid 21 Lutetia. These flybys would be part of the science mission and provide valuable testing of the onboard equipment and cameras. As a result of doing all these slingshot maneuvers and almost four complete revolutions around the Sun, it would take 10 years to get alongside the comet. After the last slingshot, Rosetta would be on an orbit that would take it far away from the Sun before it returned to the inner solar system, but that would also create a new problem. Normally a deep space mission like this would have used a nuclear thermoelectric generator like the ones on the Voyager probes to create a reliable and long-term supply of electricity. This is because the sunlight available out at the distance of Jupiter and beyond is just too little to power a spacecraft by solar panels. But the nuclear fuel used by RTGs is plutonium-238, a non-naturally occurring element itself created from neptunium-237, a byproduct of the Cold War nuclear weapons program and something that was only ever produced in quantity by the US and the Soviet Union. After the fall of the Soviet Union, production of nuclear weapons dropped dramatically and the facilities in the US that made them shut down leaving a dwindling stockpile of plutonium-238 for space missions. This shortage and the political issues around releasing this nuclear fuel for use outside the US and now Russian space programs made RTGs unavailable for ESA's Rosetta mission. So Rosetta would be the first spacecraft to use solar power past the distance of Jupiter, where there is just 4% of the sunlight compared to that of the Earth. The solar panels on Rosetta were an advanced, very high efficiency design and very large in comparison to the spacecraft itself, each one being 14 meters long and with a total combined size of 64 square meters. These will produce a maximum of 1500 watts of power at the closest point of Rosetta's orbit to the Sun and 400 watts at its farthest point. The final leg of the journey would take Rosetta on an orbit far from the Sun before returning to make its final approach to Comet 67P. This would take over two and a half years, and as the craft was now in low power mode, it was decided from a budgetary and manpower point of view to place Rosetta into hibernation until it was on its return journey. In January 2014, Rosetta was brought out of hibernation but it was now traveling some 2,800 kilometers faster than a comet and had to use much of its fuel reserves to slow down, something which would tax the mission more because earlier it had suffered a fuel leak and had to work at a lower pressure than it was designed for. Now all this time, no one actually knew exactly what the comet's nucleus looked like or what the surface was like to land on, but they did have an approximate idea of its dimensions from near-Earth observations. As Rosetta started to approach the comet, it sent back the first close-up images. It showed that it was far from the smooth, potato-shaped object that many had expected, but instead it had a rough, jagged, duck-shaped body, with two distinct lobes connected together by a thinner neck, with areas that looked like they could have come from a mountainside escarpment anywhere on Earth. In order to find a suitable landing site, Rosetta used the Osiris camera system to map the entire surface of a comet using a series of triangular shaped maneuvers over a period of 60 days. Two different methods called stereophotogrammetry and stereophotoclinometry were used to look at the shadows cast by boulders and cliffs and other surface features from hundreds of images of a comet and turn them into a topographic map and then into a 3D model of a comet. The landing site had to be somewhere that was in sunlight for as long as possible as the comet rotated in space to power the lander, but also smooth enough to land on with the least risk of the lander flipping over onto its back. It also had to avoid any outgassing vents which might start to eject material as the comet got nearer to the sun. As was mentioned earlier, the landing of the Philae lander was a passive event and not guided. It had two harpoons with grappling lines that would fire out and anchor it to the surface and screws in its feet to hold it down. 
Another major issue was that the gravity of a comet would be very weak. It was estimated to be about 1 10,000th of that of the Earth. If Philae had a hard landing, it could just bounce off the surface and back into space before it had a chance to attach itself. A number of landing sites were selected, but eventually they settled on Site J, which they believed would not only be scientifically favourable, but also a good place to land. The area was given a name as Jilkia, after the island where the temples of the island of Philae were relocated to after the construction of the Aswan Dam. In order for Philae to make a successful landing, the Rosetta orbiter had to fix its position above the chosen landing site and match the rotational speed of a comet to within one millimeter per second. If the rotational speed of the comet and the orbiter were off by even a small amount, over the seven hours it would take to descend the 20 kilometers to the surface, Philae would no longer be over the chosen landing site and could end up on a cliff or in a canyon. Once Philae was on its way to the surface, the orbiter had to turn to face Philae in order to watch its descent to the surface. Although the lander's impact speed was just one meter per second, things didn't go quite to plan. Philae bounced off the surface at 38 centimeters per second and up to a height of approximately one kilometer. If the rebound speed had been more than 44 centimeters per second, it would have escaped the comet's gravity and gone back into space. Philae did have a cold gas thruster on the top of a lander that would be used to help reduce any bounce or recoil from firing of the harpoon lines on landing. However, it was discovered that there was an issue with the thruster and it wasn't expected to work during landing. The harpoons that were meant to fire into the surface also failed to operate, so the combination of these failures greatly contributed to the bounce on landing. When Philae detected it had landed, it shut down its internal reaction wheel, but as it had actually bounced off the surface, the momentum of the reaction wheel was transferred to the lander and it started to tumble once every 13 seconds. It also appears to have caught one leg of a crater wall, which slowed its tumbling to about once every 24 seconds. Philae landed over an hour later and bounced once more before ending up on rough terrain in the shadow of a cliff at an angle of about 30 degrees, but its exact location was still unknown. In this position, the solar panels were only in direct sunlight for around 20 minutes every 12 hour rotation of a comet, which didn't allow the secondary batteries to fully charge. This meant that Philae only had enough power for around two days to carry out its experiments before going into hibernation and contact was lost with the lander. Because of the lack of direct sunlight, it wasn't known if Philae would wake up again as it was required to have at least 5.5 watts of power and for the temperature to be above minus 45 degrees C to do so. Seven months later and after repeated attempts by Rosetta, on June the 13th, 2015, a signal was received from Philae for just 78 seconds, but it was enough to show that it was still working. Because of the angle of which Philae was tilted over by, its antennae was pointing into the comet rather than out into space. Rosetta was also 200 kilometers away because of the increased dust from the outgassing of the comet. This dust could obscure Rosetta's star trackers and cause it to lose its orientation if it was too close. Because Philae was receiving only a small amount of solar energy to charge its batteries, the few communications which did occur over the following weeks were very short-lived and intermittent. Even after Rosetta was moved to 155 kilometers above the comet, the connection was still sporadic, and data from Philae revealed that one of its two radio receivers was no longer working. Whether this damage was caused by the bouncing across the surface we don't know, but it certainly didn't do it any good. The last communications with Philae were on the 9th of July, and on the 25th of July, it was decided to move Rosetta into a new orbit over the southern hemisphere of the comet to continue its planned science investigations. This new position meant that it would no longer be able to contact Philae, although over the next few months, Rosetta was back over the northern hemisphere for a few more times and listening, no further contact with Philae was made. Over one year and three months later, on the 2nd of September 2016, Philae was finally found again, 
after an exhaustive search by the ground teams and Rosetta's narrow field camera, wedged in a dark crevice on an area of a comet called Abydos, which explained the lack of solar energy to power the lander. By now, Comet 67P and Rosetta were heading back out to the asteroid belt and away from the Sun, which would reduce the power generated from its solar panels. Unlike the first hibernation, Rosetta's new orbit alongside the comet would take it farther from the Sun to over 850 million kilometers at its maximum distance. Here, there was no guarantee that there would be enough power for the onboard heaters to keep Rosetta warm enough to survive this period in deep space. So the Rosetta team had to make a decision as to what to do next. Rosetta was a spacecraft that had endured 12 harsh years in space, with two of those close to a dusty comet. There was also an upcoming month-long solar conjunction when the Sun would be between the Earth and Rosetta and the comet. This would severely limit communications and the downlinking of science data. So the science team came to the conclusion that the aging spacecraft and payload were reaching the end of their natural lifetime, and that the 30th of September 2016 would be the end of the mission. It was decided that Rosetta would perform a controlled impact into the Ma'at region of a small lobe of a comet at a landing site called Sias. During the main mission, Rosetta hadn't been able to get as close to the comet as expected due to the dust from the outgassing, so this would be one final chance to get close-up images and data from the comet. The proposed impact area had a number of active gas and dust pits, which would not only be very interesting scientifically, it also allowed the spacecraft to be in line of sight with the Earth for communications and in sunlight to illuminate the scenes. Rosetta would be taking images right up to the point of impact, after which its radio would be shut down to render it inert and the mission would be declared over. But the investigation of the data sent back will keep scientists busy for many years to come. So I'd just like to say thanks for watching and please check out some of our other videos when you get the time and don't forget to please subscribe, thumbs up and share.